Greetings and welcome. I'm Alistair and this is part five of my cigar tobacco grow right here in the Western Cape of South Africa. Apologies, I'm not recording outside, it's just too windy, so I'm recording indoors um, with a metal tree in the background, so there's still a tree in the background. Now, the Western Cape, I've been thinking about this, the Western Cape is known for many things. There is uh, scenic beauty with all the mountain ranges and beaches and sea and so on. Uh, the wine industry is huge, so we have world-class wines. We have world-class restaurants, so you have the perfect fine dining experience. And what goes well with a fine dining experience? Yes, the cigar. But for some reason, and you'd have to go back in history to find out why, there is zero cigar culture in this country, which is a shame. It just never took off. It never really came over from Europe. Um, many places in Europe, it is considered perfectly normal to have a delicious meal and to follow that immediately with coffee and a cigar. It's just part of the tradition. It just makes sense. The whole thing is then complete. And here, the cigar part is missing completely. It's a shame, but there we go. So, the year 2020, is drawing to a close. And what does that mean? It means... Yes, the festive season. Ho, ho, ho. Everyone is panic buying, trying to get those last minute presents for their families. I wonder what I'll be getting this year. Hopefully some more cigars, but that's just me. Anyway, let's carry on with the tobacco. Okay, as you can see, the plants have settled in nicely. They're looking good. But there are a few things that I could have done to lessen the transplant shock overall. So if you head over to fairtradetobacco.com, uh, lots of useful information there, and you go to the how-to section, uh, there is a, you know, how to grow tobacco. There is a section there which deals specifically with transplanting, lots of old threads and uh, lots of recommendations. And there are a few things that I could have applied to my plants before transplanting them to uh, lessen the impact of that transplant shock that they inevitably go through. Transplant shock is what you see when the seedlings are planted out. The plants become very wilted and they droop, especially during the midday heat. So it helps to rig up a bit of, uh, just a bit of protection. I've got a bit of shade cloth over just to um, cut out the worst of the sun during midday. But basically what happens during the transplanting, uh, that, that little shock window, window of shock, that's about two weeks long, uh, the roots switch from a nourishing mode where they constantly supply the leaves and the stem with, with water and nutrients. They switch to uh, anchoring mode. So they've been in a pot all this time, in my case little styrofoam cups, and the roots have taken over that complete, you know, the, the cup. But when you plant them out, that little cup, that little root ball that they've made is insufficient to anchor the plant, especially when you have new elements that you've introduced to the plant, like wind, um, the outside elements. So the plant is unstable and it can move around in the wind and that root ball will continually stay loose in the soil. So you have to keep an eye on that, try and give them as much protection as possible until those roots have started to spread out grab the surrounding soil and anchor the plant firmly and that takes a while and so while the roots are doing that they're going through a lot of growth and development sending further roots down laterally they're not focused on providing a plant 
with as much water and nutrients as it did before. So that is why you see the shock that the plants go through when the leaves are all wilted and droopy. It's perfectly normal. All the growth that, that is taking place is taking place underground. So it helps during this phase to give them a little bit of extra water. A uh, bit of extra water the roots will readily take up and just keep the plant going during that time. So there are a few things I could have done. And uh, I had a problem with the stems of my Habano 2000s, as you saw in the previous video, where they just simply snapped off when I was uh, taking them out of their little styrofoam cups. Now, what I could have done uh, while my plants were indoors still is set up uh, just a normal oscillating fan. You switch the fan on its lowest setting and you blow a bit of air over the plants and this simulates wind. And of course, the plants respond to this uh, stimuli by strengthening their stems. That's just, that's what plants do. They adapt to the environment. And so it's quite a clever idea to do this to your plants before the transplanting actually takes place. Uh, and then what you can do is just ramp up the, the fan speed over time, blow a bit of stronger air over the plants uh, as much as they can handle. And you can also rotate the plants 90 degrees every couple of days. Uh, so that you simulate this wind coming from any direction and that will strengthen those stems. It'll harden them slightly so that the stems of the plants are just a bit more tougher and able to deal with the outside world when you finally plant them out. Another trick I saw on the forum is withholding water. You can uh, simulate a little mini drought for the plants. So you withhold not too much, you know, just like say three days. Three days of water you withdraw, you withhold it from the plant. Um, what this does is it puts the plant in a survival mode. The plants retain a short-term memory so when you plant them out they will obviously experience this drought condition again and they'll automatically go into survival mode and this will actually help them get over the shock of transplant quicker. Another side effect of course if you have them in little containers is the soil will shrink from the sides of the containers making it easier to remove the plant from the container when you plant them out. So that helps as well. Another one I saw on the forum was trimming the leaves. If your plant has three or four leaves you can uh, trim a third of the biggest leaves just snip them right off nice clean cuts with the scissors or something and this also puts the plant into a bit of a fight or flight mode um, and also while it's uh, in its shock state out in the garden um, the transpiration the loss of moisture through the leaves is lessened because you've gone and taken away some of the surface area it also doesn't catch as much wind uh, so less movement of the stem and the, the root ball while it's trying to anchor itself and just in general, that little mini bit of shock you put the plant in helps it get over the transplant shock a bit quicker. And again, another one is the timing, the timing of the planting. Now I left it a bit late. I had no choice because we were busy moving house. And moving house is very, very stressful. <laughs> the logistics and, you know, it's just, a, it's just a complete pain in the butt. So I'm glad it's all, it's all over and we've all settled in now and so on. But I had to put the plants just to one side while we we're doing all the moving and the settling in and so on. And then I had to find a place for them to, to be out in the garden. And it took me a while to make the bed and so on. So all that time, the plants were indoors. They weren't in the sunshine. Uh, they were actually getting a bit leggy. So they're actually bigger than they have to be. I would preferably have planted them out when they were half that size. And if you think when they're half the size, uh, it's less wind resistance. They don't get battered around by the wind so much. Um, and because they were so tall, plants were kind of falling over a lot, especially the Criolla 98. They, they get quite leggy. Um, they're quite vigorous growers, I find. So timing. Uh, in my case, my excuse is the move. I had to move house. But uh, ideally, you want to plant them out as soon as they're ready for being planted out. If you leave it too long, they get a bit leggy um, and, and unstable, and it just, it just takes them a bit longer to get over that shock. So there we go. Now remember this little guy, he got cut down by that nasty cutworm. And look, the plant is pushing again. Some new growth has popped up there. This is the old leaf. Um, I've kind of left it on there because it acts like a solar panel, giving a bit of photosynthesis to the root system underneath. And the root system is nicely established now, so I'm just gonna let it carry on and see what happens. And in my later videos going forwards, we will deal with suckering. And as you can see, I'm gonna probably let, it's basically formed a sucker. This is a shoot that's coming out of the side. I'll let this one become a main plant. 
and I will get rid of this one down here. So the idea is you have one strong main plant and anything that pops out the side will lessen the overall quality of the tobacco leaves. You don't want to let the side suckers become their own kind of their own plant. It lessens the overall quality. You just want one strong plant. You chop off any small suckers that come up so that all the nutrients go into the main uh, network of leaves, which is what you will end up harvesting. So yeah, we'll see uh, what happens with this one. And now the plant that got cut off by the cutworm, my mother recommended that, where's the camera? There you are. I can hardly see it on my phone. Uh, my mother recommended that I put it in some water to see if it makes roots. <sighs> Look at that. Look at those amazing roots. It actually pushed roots right out of the side there. And so one plant has effectively become two plants. Now what I did as well, I did a bit of googling, uh, because if you want some roots to come out of a cutting, um, ideally you put some uh, rooting hormone in the water as well. I don't have any rooting hormone, but a very good substitute is ground cinnamon. So I sprinkled the stem very thickly. You can still see there's lots of, lots of, let me just see if I can get the, come on, focus. Anyway, I sprinkled loads of cinnamon in there and um, yeah, lots and lots of roots. I don't know if it would have rooted had I not put in the cinnamon. But I thought it's best not to take any chances and just chuck a whole lot of cinnamon in there and there we go. Now, had I done this with the Habano plants that snapped off, would I have a bunch of extra plants? Possibly. But what do I do with this one? I don't really have space in my backy patch. Space is kind of used up and that one in the ground that got sliced off by the cutworm it's got a very nice established root system, so there's no way I'm digging that up just to put this one in there, because this one will go into transplant shock when I plant it out. So I think I will just find a suitable container and grow this one on the side. It is a Habano 2000 after all, and I only have two plants in the patch. Well, three, with that little stub that's busy pushing, so the more the merrier. Another thing I wanted to mention, uh, I was, I was worried about cutworms after the first one got sliced off. And so I put, uh, put these little foil collars on. That was one thing that was recommended. I also sprinkled some wood ash around. And if you have diatomaceous earth and crushed eggshells, uh, it's very um, sort of uh, rough, jagged material that the worms find it very uncomfortable to, to move over that's the idea of the diatomaceous earth and the crushed eggshells and wood ash but i haven't had any problems since and what i have noticed is a bit of mole activity and right where the cat is excuse me there was a tunnel over there that seems to be closed now did you dig it closed you silly cat so i think what happens is the mole comes out at night and snuffles around the plants to see if there are any insects and should there have been any worms that mole would have noshed them so that's pretty good I think I can take these collars off now, they're quite loose, so I'll take them off. I think the stems are big enough now that the worms are not a threat anymore, thank goodness. Because the last thing I want is some more decapitated plants. I've uh, given the plants a little bit of fertilizer as well. I came across this guano flow and I thought, hmm, that sounds interesting. I'll probably give the plants a, a little bit of everything they need just to give them a little bit of something, something. Now the idea of fertilizing, fertilization, fertilizers, fertilizer application, is you can give them some fertilizer every now and then while there are small growing plants. But as soon as they become knee height, then you should stop. And this is because it will have an adverse effect on your, um, on your, I'm not sure about the color curing, but I think it makes it harder to ferment the leaves if they've uh, 
if they've had too much fertilizer during their, their lifetime. And I think it comes down to those, those unwanted compounds in the leaves that you want to get rid of during the fermentation part of the whole process. And with over fertilizing, you end up with more of those compounds. So it either makes it harder or longer to ferment the leaves. So it's recommended that you stop when they reach knee height. Now let's just have a quick look. There's still a way to go. And this plant is looking beautiful. It's a Havana 142. Look at those fantastic leaves, but it's nowhere near knee height yet. So every two or three weeks, I'll give them a, a little bit of this guano flour. Just mix it with some water and I just chuck it on there. I tend to dilute it more than necessary. I'd rather under fertilize them than over fertilize them because I think they're, they're looking pretty good. I think the soil is quite nourishing anyway, but it doesn't hurt to give them a little bit extra. You can see the difference between Little Dutch and Havana. Look at those broad leaves of the Havana. The Little Dutch has longer, narrow, well not longer, but narrower leaves. Like little narrow spears. I can't really tell these others apart. The Criolla 98 is looking a bit spindly in comparison. That might be because they got a bit leggy before I planted them out. And this is another Havana. The Havanas are looking fantastic. So out of this batch, the Havanas are a clear winner. Oh, that Criollo is not looking too bad. This is the Habano, and the Habanos are lagging behind a bit. But overall, I'm very happy with the progress of my plants. Oh, there'll definitely be a good harvest this year. All right, thanks for stopping by. Um, once again, I'd like to remind you to please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And um, this will probably be my last video of 2020, but uh, still plenty to do in this grow. There's still sucker hunting, um, hunting those suckers, cutting them off before they can develop too far on the plants. Um, when the plants start flowering, then I'll have to start deciding which ones to keep and which ones to, to chop off, I'll just call them topping. Um, and the ones that I will allow to go to seed will have to be bagged, so we'll cover all that. And then there's the harvesting. And then after the harvesting, it's the color curing. And after the color curing, it is the fermentation. And I must still get my kiln up and running for that. So there's lots to see, lots to do, lots to prepare for. So I will see you guys in the new year. I want you guys to stay safe. And if you're traveling in the festive season, please be careful. And stay safe. And I'll catch you guys in the next video.